And thank you very much for those of you who had your cameras turned on. I appreciate that because it's always uh, it's always nice to be able to see faces, uh, especially to see the faces of who I'm talking to and to be able to see you when you're talking. So I do appreciate you having the cameras turned on. That's that's very nice. I mean, let's face it, if I if I turn my camera off and I sit here and talk with a black square, that's not very interesting to you. So that's why I turn my camera on as well. So it works both ways, but I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. So my name is Daniel Miller. I'm one of the instructors with Teasel Canada and welcome to uh, to our first session for this group. Uh, this is the. Uh, this course, uh, I think there was a bit of a delay as I was just explaining to Dave. Uh, there was a problem with, uh, with the email transmissions coming out of the IONIS platform, which is what TESOL uses uh, to send their emails out. So I think they've got that sorted out. But anyway, you're here, so you must have received emails and you've been communicating with Simon Baker, I would expect. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So welcome to all of you. Hello, Fareshta, how are you today? You're muted. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm really awesome. glad to see you today, and I'm really excited to begin this course with you. Very good. We're happy to have all of you with us today. Fareshta, what, what country are you calling from? I'm from Iran. Actually, it's my country, but now I'm living in Vancouver. Oh, you're you're in Vancouver where Teasel is. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So welcome to today's class and welcome to the Thank course. You. The uh, the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to share the screen. First thing we're going to do is have a look at the uh, the Canvas platform. So have you already been into the Canvas platform? Yes. Yes. Okay, so if you've already gone to the Canvas platform, uh, that means you've signed in satisfactorily and uh, you can go through this menu bar on the left hand side. Under the announcements tab, which is where we are right now, this is where you can find recordings of previous webinars. And any recordings that you see here, you certainly may view them. So you can just click on them and you can have a look at them and listen to them. If, if you go inside this top one, for instance, you get the uh, the YouTube link for the Teasel Canada chat chat channel. And inside this link for the Teasel Canada channel, that's difficult to say three times quickly. Nice. You get all these. These are all past webinars as well. So this webinar, this I created this webinar. We will be doing this webinar. I'll be doing this one with you. Uh, and uh, other instructors will do other, other webinars with you. But, uh, but anyway, you can go in into this link and you can, this is one of the other instructors, instructors Anna Patricia, she's in Brazil. You can go into that YouTube link and you can have a look at any of these webinars that are in there. Okay. So definitely. I just have to stop sharing the screen here now so I can get back to my other tab. Where did my other tab go? There we are. Okay. So definitely uh, go into that announcements tab and have a look at that. Now on the uh, on the Canvas platform, I would suggest that you begin at the beginning at the the home page, which is this page, and I would suggest that you read it through, and watch all these videos because there's useful information in all the videos, and I found that by reading through this material. By reading through the the background material, it helped answer some questions that I had about the Teasel program and the Canvas platform. So I would suggest that you read this through. 
If you have any questions about what you read, jot down your questions, write them down and, and ask them uh, when we meet the next time. I will work with you to answer any questions that I possibly can. Uh, and I don't have the answers to all questions, but if I don't know the answer, I will probably have a good idea where you can go to find out the answer. Because the important thing is, is understanding as you work through this course and understanding how it's designed, understanding how it's put together and understanding the expectations of you all make it work a lot better. So I will help you in any way I can with that material. Then there's the modules tab. In the modules tab, this is where you actually have the course. This is the course material. You, you go to each of these pages, you, you click on the page, you do the, you work through the lesson or, or you watch the video or whatever the case might be. And then there are worksheets for some of the pages and you work through those. And, and then you, you go to the next, the next button. And there are quizzes periodically. Now, it's very important as you work through these module sections, it's very important that you complete all the quizzes. If you do not do the quizzes, see the Canvas platform keeps track of the quizzes that you complete. It keeps track of your marks and it keeps track. If you don't do a quiz, then there's a blank section uh, on your, your Canvas platform on the, the information stored on the Canvas platform for you. If you miss a quiz or you miss several quizzes, then later on in the course, you might have modules that are grayed out that you can't get into. If it's grayed out and you can't open it, then you won't be able to do it. So it's very important to do all those quizzes as you're going through. I'll draw your attention right now to this TESOL resources spot under modules, right near the top of modules. The TESOL resources, there are lots of very good uh, PDF documents here that are very helpful for you. But I would suggest that you should download the TESOL manual and keep looking for the TESOL Canada handbook to be updated. If you would like, I can email you a slightly older version of the TESOL Canada Handbook because I found this TESOL manual and the TESOL Canada Handbook, I found those to be extremely helpful in preparing my essays and my assignments, preparing my lesson work and different projects for, uh, for the TESOL course. So I'd like to have them. I wouldn't mind having an older version. Um, is there an ETA as to when the handbook was going to be updated or other than soon? Well, Dave, I honestly don't have an answer to that question because that little message has been there now for several months. Okay. So I, I doubt very much that that soon means anytime soon. It's probably going to be a while yet before it uh, before it gets gets updated, but in the meantime. I will be happy to email you a copy of that. And to help you out with that piece of information. I'm putting my email address in the chat box so that you can copy it. You bear with me while I type this in. I, I can't type and talk at the same time. Just have to check, make sure I spelled my name correctly. Yes. One time I spelled my name wrong. So, so it, there's my email address. If you would like a copy of that older handbook, just send me an email and just ask me to send you the older handbook. And I'll send that to you shortly within the next day or so. 
okay? Because it is helpful. Both the handbook and the Teasel manual were both very helpful documents. I actually printed them out. Personally, I printed them out so that I could highlight them. I could put highlights in them and I could make notes in them and I used to use them quite extensively to study for the exam as well. Now you have two exams. You have a midterm exam, which is based on modules one and modules two. And then the final board exam after the end of the course is based on uh, the entire course. But modules one and module two are the basis of the midterm exam. So you need to be working towards the completion of modules one and modules two uh, over the next two to three weeks so that you're ready for the midterm exam. Okay. So as much as this is a self-paced, self-study course, uh, there is a little bit of a, a timeline to it, and there are time expectations to the completion of assignments and to the writing of exams in order to keep you on track to get the course done in a, a logical time frame. So Teasel doesn't want you to spend two or three years completing the course. They want you to complete the course within three to six months uh, or six to nine months, you know, something to that effect. They want you to complete it within that time frame. So when I started doing the Teasel course in uh, May of 2020, that was shortly after the pandemic started. And I, I decided to study the course for two reasons. Number one, I was looking for some way that I could make a little bit of extra income because my regular business as a financial advisor was dramatically impacted in a negative fashion when the pandemic hit because I could not meet with clients. I could not meet with people. I couldn't go out and do seminars to, to generate business. So I, I needed to, to get some business going. I also wanted to do something that was worthwhile and was beneficial to other people. I've been involved with education for over half a century. And so doing the Teasel course and working, continuing to work in education uh, and teaching of English to speakers of other languages and, and training you folks to become teachers to speakers of, uh, to uh, speakers, teachers of English to speakers of other languages helping you become that, that role. Uh, that's all part of the education process. And English is one of my teaching options. I taught English in secondary school system in Ontario many years ago, uh, as well as visual arts and music and mathematics and history. I, I taught all those subjects at one point in time going back years ago. So it, it was kind of a logical step for me to take to do this Teasel program. So when I started it in 2020, I began that program and, and at that time there was no midterm exam. The midterm exam was added in about a year ago. Uh, so I never had the experience of writing the midterm exam. I waited and wrote the final board exam, uh, which was based on the entire program. Uh, I think having the midterm exam is a very good idea because it breaks it up a little bit for you and gives you a bit of a sense partway through how things are doing and how you're progressing. And I think that's very important as a student in any program. So the midterm exam, I think, is a beneficial addition for you. If you have any questions at any point during these webinars with me, by all means, interrupt me to ask your question. I won't think you're being rude at all because I want to deal with any questions you have right in the moment as we're going along. So definitely just jump in and say you have a question you'd like to ask and I'll deal with it right away while we're on the spot with it. 
Okay, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Does anybody have questions about the Canvas platform? I don't. Okay. We go to the assignments tab. You see all the quizzes are listed. But don't don't rely on on the assignments tab to give you all the list of quizzes. Follow through the modules. So go through the modules, read the material, do each quiz, go to the next lesson the next day, read the material, do the quiz, and follow that process. Okay? And you will end up with a a solid method to your 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 process through the through the course. I'm going to I have one basic rule with with the, these modules. The basic rule is don't jump ahead. Follow it through so you don't miss anything. But having said that, I'm all also going to say to you we need to jump ahead to uh, just after day four, I believe it is. Second language acquisition just after day four. I need you to make just make a note of going to the second language acquisition tab. Because inside this tab. Well, for one thing, you have a, a lecture here by Dr. Noam Chomsky. It's a phenomenal lecture that he gives. It's an incredible lecture. I listened to it many times because it's so good. But on this page. You have your foundation essay assignment, and this is the only spot where you'll have this foundation essay assignment spelled out for you with the details of what you're supposed to do. Basically, what you're supposed to do is pick one of these eight topics. And write a three or four page paper about it. This is two to five pages. Mine was three pages long. In fact, I'm going to show you my. Here's my foundation essay. So I did my foundation essay on topic number eight. Choose two or three methods of language teaching and compare. Discuss the merits of each. So I started off with an introduction. I said what I was going to be writing about. I identified the. The language methods that I was going to be discussing and talking about compared and contrasted them and then gave a little bit of a summary at the end of it. And there you go, three pages later, my foundation foundation essay was done. So when they say three to five pages, they mean three to five pages. Don't turn this into a 20 page research paper because that's just too extensive. This is just a, a three page paper to get you started, get you thinking about about these different things. So that's what I did for my my foundation essay. essay. I did topic number eight. So that's under modules. Just after day four. In the second language acquisition tab, that's where you find the information about your first written paper, your first essay. Now, due dates, when are, when are assignments due? At some point in time, uh, you will probably get a, an email from TESOL identifying due dates. But a basic rule of thumb is when I give you an assignment or any one of us gives you an assignment, you should consider that it's due two weeks later. So if you've got the assignment now today, then what's the date today? This is the 13th, so uh, March 27th would be the due date for you to email the assignment directly to TESOL. And here's the email address right here, info at teaselcanada.org. That's where you email your assignments to. 
for marking. When Teasel receives all your assignments, they take those assignments and they send them out to different instructors. So I sometimes I'm asked to mark some assignments and sometimes somebody else is asked to mark some assignments. And whenever whenever I'm asked to mark assignments for any of the participants in the course, I mark the assignment and I always immediately send you an email with some feedback. Because I think that the feedback in some ways is even more important than an actual mark. Of course, I know you want to know the mark, but I'm not allowed to give you the mark on it. If I I'm asked to give the assignments a mark and send those those suggested marks to Dr. Valley. And then he posts the marks, the final marks on the, the canvas platform. But I am I am asked to give you uh, an email with feedback in it about each of the assignments that I mark. So I, I always give you feedback. And I do that fairly quickly. So, so there's your your first assignment, the first essay. Any questions about that, folks? Thank you. I have a question. Uh, I think uh, like a half of this course is practicum. Yeah. Uh, are are you a teacher currently? Actually, I was when I was in my country, but now I'm newcomer here and I'm not a teacher till now here. Okay, but do you have teaching experience? You do have teaching experience. Yes. Do you have a teaching certificate from when you taught in Iran? No, unfortunately, not one that is accepted here. I, I understand that. I realize you'd have to go through a, a study program here to get certification. But yeah. did you take teacher training in Iran? Yeah, I did. So you have a, a teaching certificate from Iran. Yeah. Have you sent a PDF of that, a scan of that to Teasel? Um, I don't remember. I should check it. Yes, you should check it because, and, and this is going back to your question for us to the half of this course is practicum. Well, that could be the case if, if you do not have teaching experience, then you are required to do some teaching practicum and and one of one of the instructors in TESOL. So, for example, myself, I have gone online to observe uh, participants in previous groups. I've observed them teaching students, so I observe what they do with the lesson plan. Uh, and, and that happens if you don't have teaching experience. If you have teaching experience in your background or you're certified as a teacher in, in some other country, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what country you were certified as a teacher. If you have teacher certification, send a copy of that, send a scan of that document to TESOL because you might be able to be exempted from having to do the practicum of the teaching. Actually, uh, I do want to do it here too, because, you know, the atmosphere is different. Uh, the work experience is different and I want to do it, the practicum. Uh, but my question was that uh, I don't know any language institutes here. And uh, if I want to do the practicum, uh, do you introduce us the institutions that we can, for example, do the observation or teaching or anything that we should do? Well, actually, Simon Baker, helps the participants, helps you participants get set up. He helps you to to link you with students who, who you can teach online, or he helps you to become acquainted with institutions where you could actually go in and do the teaching in person. So yeah. I, don't, I don't do that part. Where I come in is, is if you're teaching online, then I can join your call and I can observe what your teaching is like. And I send a, a, re, a report into Teasel about it, an assessment of your teaching. So, but you you can ask Simon Baker to help you with introductions to students who you could teach online. Thank you. I'd be glad to do so. Okay. Yes, Dave, you have a question. 
Should I be using this uh, raising and lowering hand thing? That's kind of new to me. Um, I had a similar question because uh, I, I understand the uh, requirement for the practicum, but I didn't spell out uh, how uh, we uh, enabled ourselves uh, to get that practicum. Because, um, uh, you know, I thought, is it up to me to um, actually go into a school and accumulate some hours? Does that mean that I have to prepare lesson plans, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, or can I do it in an online basis and uh, do I need to be observed? Um, that kind of question. So. You, you, do, you do need to be observed by a, a, typically by a TESOL instructor, but sometimes, so, so let's go to your idea of you going into a school and a, arranging to do some teaching uh, inside a school. So if you have access to setting that arrangement up, uh, and you inform Teasel that that's what you're doing, then uh, Simon Baker would communicate with the teacher who could observe you in the school, even though they're not a Teasel instructor. If they're the, a teacher within that school, they could observe you and fill out a report about how you did with the teaching. But it would require, uh, wherever you do it, whether it's in a classroom or online, it would require that you do some lesson preparation and uh, preparing lesson plans, that type of thing, yes. But as I mentioned to Foresta just a moment ago, the uh, you know it, if you get uh, if you get Simon Baker to set you up with online students, then uh, then you can have a bit more freedom to what you prepare with your lesson plans. If you go into a school, you're going to have to follow their curriculum. Of course. But there's also a requirement, is it 50 hours for the initial standard certificate? Uh, I honestly forget how many hours it is for each of the certificates. I didn't pay a lot of attention to that because I didn't have to do it. No, I mean, um, and I and I do, because um, I have no prior uh, formal teaching uh, certificates or uh, training that way. Sure. Uh, probably the, uh, I'm going to say that it's at least 50 hours for the foundation certificate. And that's, uh, and that has to happen more or less by the second week, or it should, um, you should be getting something going or thinking about it or, um, determining how you're going to get it accomplished pretty soon. I would think. Yeah, you should be getting, getting going on that. Yes, because the. What what comes right down to is in order to graduate with the certificate, you have to complete not only the coursework and the exams, but you have to do the the practicum as well and have that completed. Okay. I'll contact Simon for that, I think. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Send Simon Baker an email, ask for a bit of guidance and and a few pointers. Just confirm with him. How many hours you, you do need for the foundation program? Because it's a different number of hours for foundation. It's more hours for the advanced level and it's even more hours for the diploma level. Is there anybody else that is going to absolutely be required to do the practicum work in order to get the TESOL certificate? So if you don't have any teaching experience in your past, or you're not certified as a teacher, then you will have to do the practicum. Is anybody else in that situation? Actually, I have experience of teaching almost six years at uh, three levels, like uh, primary, tertiary, and secondary. So do I have to uh, share the certificates from all these three levels, or uh, is it fine if I share any one? Well, you, you should share the, the levels, the, the certificates for all the levels. Mm -hmm. And do you have any written documentation from a, a, a principal or a, a headmaster at the schools where you taught? Uh, yes, I have applied for, you know, my primary one and uh, in secondary, I can uh, provide that because right now I am teaching at college level. And uh, other than that, I teach as a visiting faculty in universities as well. 
So over there, I teach my like uh, undergraduate students uh, functional English, business communication and ethics, uh, academic writing, reading and writing. So uh, more or less, I have experience of all uh, you know levels. But the thing is that in university, the official document that we have of experience is our uh, you know contracts. They don't uh, give us uh, experience of teaching. Uh, they said that your contracts are your experiences. Certainly. If we want it, then we have to give, uh, you know, um, an application or we have to talk to our HODs. That means head of departments. Uh, so uh, first they are going to inquire about, like why we are asking for the certificates and then they are going to provide us if they think okay, it's valid. And that, that's fine. So what, what I would suggest that you, you should do uh, with that information here, uh, you should send Simon Baker an email with mm -hmm. scans of your teaching certificates and explain okay. explain your teaching experience. Okay. And ask if you can be excused from doing the the uh, the teaching the teaching. Yeah, requirement. because you know two of the certificates is like easily available for uh, me, but the third one will be difficult for me because for that I have to you know approach my head of the department and I have to uh, you know write a request letter to issue me the certificate. Sure. And so probably, probably the other the other first two are going to be quite adequate. Okay, thank you. Yes. So Nicolika, do you have teaching experience? Yeah, well, I do have teaching experience, but um, I don't have any certification. I um, back in my country, I used to take um, the upper classes in the elementary section for preparing them for the national exams in English, and then at the same time, I was teaching, like in, I was doing teacher training as well. So I was just wondering, is that enough? And have more than five years experience in that. So is that enough to exempt me or I still have to do the practical? Well, and that's a very good question. And I think you should definitely send that explanation to Simon Baker. Okay. And tell him okay. everything you just told us. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I cannot say to you, that's enough. You don't have to do the practicum. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to say that one way or the other. So yeah. it, it could be enough, but you need to get the the decision directly from Simon Baker. I will. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Carlo, welcome to the class and good to have you with us today. Hi, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're just fine. Oh my gosh, perfect. <laughs> I was so having some difficulty connecting, by the way. Uh it, it kept it kept bouncing me out and and uh and, and so on. So I apologize, you know, for my tardiness. That's okay. That happens. Your technology, you gotta love technology. I do. About a month ago, <laughs> about a month ago, I I was not even able to do the webinar on Monday because I just didn't have te I didn't have internet that day. Wow. My internet was just down. And and I couldn't figure out the reason for it, except that you know may, maybe maybe a, a nasty squirrel was chewing on a wire somewhere, but. But other than that, I couldn't figure out why I had no internet. But you know, the technology we we work around the problems that we encounter. And uh, good to have you with us today. And I'm wondering, do you have teaching experience? I I'm ex-military, uh, so I when I was in the service, I, I was uh, I was teaching uh, electronics uh, in in uh, uh, in the Air Force. Oh, excellent! Very good. So I would definitely uh, send Simon Baker an email and explain that, and and give him a sense of how many how many hours a week or how many hours a month you would have spent actually doing teaching of of that the electronics, and that might qualify you to be exempted from uh, from doing the practicum. I don't know, but ask Simon Baker because if if you can. If you can be exempted from doing the the, uh, the the practicum, that's just going to save you time. Of course. So I would definitely send send Simon Baker an email with that explanation, Carlo. Perfect. Perfect. Good. And Natalie, how about you? Teaching experience. So on mute, on mute, I think. You're you're muted, Natalie. 
Thanks, guys. Yeah, I do have some teaching experience. I do. And so do you have a teaching certificate? I do. I have that as well. It's a teaching diploma. So that, yeah, that's fine. So scan that. Mm -hmm. Email the scan to Simon Baker. Okay. And or, or photograph it and send a photograph of it. Either way is fine. Okay. They just want to be able to see it, right? Right, of course. Yes. And then give an explanation of what your teaching experience has been. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I know Simon Baker is going to really appreciate me having this conversation with all of you because now he's going to get all these emails from you about about the, the teaching experience. And that, but that's fine. That That's his role. So mm -hmm. send him an email, all of you, uh, with your, your teaching experience and with the scans of your documents, okay? Perfect. And if you have any other questions, you can always send me an email as well. I don't know, I'll always have every answer, but if I don't have an answer, we'll figure out how to find the answer for you. Okay. And what would that uh, email address be? For Simon Baker? Uh, I know for you. So check your chat window. Oh, my I, chat window. Okay, hold on. It's up a little bit, so I think I put that in before Carlo came into the call. You okay. might not be able. You might not be able to see my email address, Carlo, because if you come into the call, no, I see it. I see it here. Thank you. Oh, you can see it there. Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Fine. That's fine. So, uh, so by all means, send me an email if if you have any questions, and I'll do my best to help answer them as well. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to do a quick little PowerPoint here. This is just about uh, uh, getting onto Canvas and getting up set up for Canvas and using Canvas and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll just get it running here as a full full view, expanded a bit so you can see it more easily. So. If, to get signed in, you be sure, always be sure to use the very same email that you use when you signed up for for uh, the Teasel program in the first place. So the the email address that you use when you communicate with Simon Baker, always use the same email address because when when uh, when they register you for the Canvas platform. They use that email address that you've you've been sending to them. That you've been using to send the messages, because if you change the email address. You won't be able to sign in. It'll kick you out. So always use the same email address and then whatever password you created, of course. Your username is the password, create your password. Your username is, is your email and then create your password. And review the Canvas homepage. Once you begin the modules, work through them consecutively. Do not jump ahead, except for going to the second language foundation where you've got the the essay information. You do need to jump ahead and get that. Complete each quiz to ensure access to the next module. If you cannot access a module or a quiz, Sometimes that happens, or if you have any other questions, then send, this is Simon Baker's email address. Info at teaselcanada.org is for Simon Baker. If you cannot access a module or a quiz, send him an email and ask him to unlock it for you, please, or explain why you cannot access it because he can unlock any, any of our uh, Canvas platforms. I don't have access to that administrative side of things, so I cannot unlock it, but Simon Baker can unlock the Canvas platform for you if you're having trouble. And now we're gonna take a look at the Canvas website, except that we already did that, so that's fine. So we don't need to uh, to go and look at the Canvas website again, unless you have questions. Anybody have questions about that? 
I, I have a quick question. I, um, when I went on there, I, I sent a, I sent a message, uh, you know, through the messaging, you, you know, uh, icon there, uh, but I never got a reply back. So I'm, I'm not sure if I've done that correctly or I don't know where that message went to. What, where are you talking about? You sent him a message through. So I, I went to canvas. Uh, through the I, box here. I actually had put it onto my little, uh, onto my mobile. And so I'm able to log in and everything. Um, but there's an icon there that says, uh, inbox, for example. And, uh, here. yes, so, yes. And so and you were. Yeah. And so when I opened that, I, I sent a message, uh, you know, just asking, you know, some, you know, some questions, but. I never got a reply back, so I, I'm I'm not really sure that that's sort of working on on my end, I guess. Well, that that's a very good point, and uh, I I don't know if it's working or not. I only ever received two messages through that inbox. I mean, they, these go back to uh, 2021 <laughs> and 2020, so that's that's the extent of my inbox activity. On the Canvas platform, uh, beyond those two, those two messages, I never, I never, uh, I never received any other messages. Okay. I'd even forgot about this one. Doctor Valley wished me a happy birthday. <laughs> so, so I, I would suggest that if you want to. Uh, if you do want to, if you do want to contact Teasel, you should probably just send them an email uh, the, the regular way. Okay. I'll do that. Just through email addresses, right? Yes. Because I, I wouldn't rely on that inbox to be, uh, to be reliable in, in communicating with messages. Canvas is, is quite a good platform, uh, but it does have a few little downfall points. One thing that I wish existed on the Canvas platform was a search bar. So there's, there's no search bar that you can type in a, an item that you're looking for. You have to remember where things are and, or, and figure out where things are. But that's okay. I can live without a search bar. So we're going to begin into some course material now. And the first thing I'm going to do is, is a, a short little presentation about first language acquisition. So first language acquisition as children, the child passes through stages of development and stages of language acquisition. Each stage must be completed before moving to the next stage. A child cannot just jump to making full statements uh, grammatically correct. They need to go through the evolution of developing stages along the way and learning how to build sentences, how to build paragraphs. You know, none of us can become an, a neuroscientist overnight. The first type of, of utterance, the first type of language acquisition is called the reduplication process, where the young child repeats a certain syllable, and it's the, the data type of utterance that, uh, that the child is, is going through. Telegraphic speech comes along next. That's the economic use of words. So the, the young child might say, Dada, go here. Mama, come now. That type of thing. It's very economic use of words. They don't even uh, don't even make full sentences yet. It's isolated nouns and adjectives. And very important in the young child's learning process of language is the mother or parent role. 
in modern life, it could be the father who is the primary caregiver just as easily as the mother. Or maybe the primary caregiver is actually a, a, a caregiver, like a sitter, where the child is left for, 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 the day, for daycare. And that person becomes the primary role model. Whoever it is, they provide the young child with social interaction and modeling speech patterns and speech, uh, speech types of modeling that the child picks up on. <clears throat> I mentioned Noam Chomsky a few minutes ago and in the, the modules under second language acquisition, that video by Noam Chomsky, definitely you should watch that video. Gives you a very good basis of understanding for the whole course. Chomsky has had a theory, has a theory. Chomsky, I believe Chomsky is 94 right now and uh, still living in the UK. And uh, I heard him present a lecture, a recorded lecture about a year ago. And even at the age of 93, 94, what a brilliant mind and what a what a capable speaker, just absolutely phenomenal to listen to somebody uh, speak like he does, especially at that age and still having it all together, you know, it's just amazing. But he proposed a theory in 1965 of a language acquisition device, LAD. His theory was that we all have, we're born with this LAD this language acquisition device inside our brain. And then all we need is exposure to, uh, to language uh, being spoken around us so that we can, it triggers the language acquisition device into correct use. He proposed that we all have this innate predisposition to learning languages and we're born with the wiring in place. Oh, I thought it was longer than that. I thought there was another slide. It's a different, uh, different PowerPoint I'm thinking of. That's okay. So the language acquisition device, we'll come across that. Let me just see if I can find that quickly. Because it is quite fascinating, this language acquisition device that that he has as a theory. Got it. It's in my second language acquisition PowerPoint, but I'm just going to jump to the language acquisition device. So here's Noam Chomsky, the American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, and historian. He was a major figure in analytic philosophy one of the founders of cognitive science, and he played a pivotal role in the decline of linguistic behaviorism. And he was particularly critical of B.F. Skinner. So Chomsky's language acquisition device, this is a diagram of how he described the mechanism. So you have the linguistic input. This is what we hear as a child. The input comes in through our ears goes into the brain module, the language acquisition device, and the linguistic processing skills and the existing knowledge that Chomsky claims we're all born with, it, it all works together to generate a theory of language, the phonology, morphology, semantics, and syntax, which determines the child's grammatical competence the comprehension of other speech and the speech production. 
And this is just another diagram of the mechanism of innate theory, the language acquisi acquisition device. You'll come across references to this in the Canvas platform as well. And there are other diagrams and, and other explanations of it, but uh, I find oftentimes a, a quick visual representation of a concept helps us to get it more cemented in our minds and, and helps us with the understanding of it. And then there was Krashen's second language acquisition. And he he says, Stephen Krashen said that 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 develops exclusively through comprehensible input. So Krashen was not a believer of the language acquisition device. Krashen said that uh, as a second language, students acquire language competence by exposure to language that is both understandable and meaningful to them. By concentrating on meaning, they subconsciously acquire form. So there are different theories around how language is acquired. You've got uh, Noam Chomsky, you've got Stephen Krashen, and these are all explained in, in the, uh, the Canvas platform. But you've got, uh, you've got those, those different philosophies. And uh, part of the, the process that I found going through the Teasel course Part of the process was coming down to a decision in my own mind <clears throat> as to which theories I subscribe to, and which theories I could support, which methodologies I thought made sense, and so that's where that's where understanding the material uh, becomes key to making decisions when you're answering questions or when you're writing an essay on a certain topic. <clears throat> so we're going to have a, a look now at a PowerPoint that's talking about the introduction to second or foreign language teaching. Does anybody have any questions before I start into this? Good to go. All right. So, what are the advantages of teaching second language? Homework can involve speaking tasks or listening to the radio or watching TV and reading newspaper articles. It encourages students to seek out opportunities for practice. It encourages students to seek corrective feedback from others. If you have students keep a log or a diary of extra class learning, that helps them with the development of their, their second language as well. Plan and carry out field trips. Plan social mixers with native English speakers. Invite speakers into the classrooms. Now, planning and carrying out field trips during the pandemic, that was virtually impossible to do, but it has started to open up a little bit now. And uh, classes, students are able to go and visit places. But even during the pandemic, I know of many teachers who who did virtual field trips with their students. And they, they took their students to, to visit various art galleries around the globe uh, because most art galleries now have virtual tours set up in their, uh, on their websites. So you can visit an art gallery you can visit the Louvre in Paris, France, and you can see the Mona Lisa painting and do it all online uh, without having to actually go to Paris. So there are ways of, of accomplishing the field trips and even social mixers. You can have a, a group join together on, on a Zoom or a Skype call and they can uh, they can each have their own little dish of snacks and their own favorite beverage and you can have a mi uh, social mixer and discuss topics and and have an event online and inviting speakers into classrooms uh, i've gone into many classrooms over the years uh, but even during the pandemic 
uh, I, I went into certain classrooms online and did a special uh, presentation or, or spoke about a certain topic uh, to groups of students. And so, uh, you know, using the technology uh, and incorporating the technology into teaching and into regular everyday classroom teaching uh, has now become absolutely a way of life. And I believe that technology is going to be a very significantly uh, important incorporation into teaching for many years into the future, probably for all time to come. I think we're going to see it swing even more so that uh, there's more and more online education happening rather than in person in the classroom. Of course, most of my teaching experience was actually in a classroom or private instruction. I, mean, I started teaching piano when I was 11 years old, so that was private one on one at home in the family living room. But then I got older, did my university. Uh, at university, I studied art history, I studied English literature, 17th century French literature. I studied musical instruments, many musical instruments, uh, played many musical instruments in, in orchestras and bands. And uh, then I went into the teaching environment, the secondary school teaching environment. And I taught a lot of subjects in secondary school. But I never did online teaching until just recent years. So I did a little bit of online teaching and was involved with a little bit of online education uh, a few years ago. And then when the pandemic hit uh, in 2020, I was, at that time, I was teaching a university course in Toronto and, uh, and all of a sudden, within the span of, of a couple of weeks, we were transitioned into an online environment. So the, the teachers and the students all had to figure this out on the fly. And it was a, a very interesting learning curve it's one of those learning curves that sort of went back on itself and turned over backwards, you know, and there were times when I wasn't sure if if I had any clue at all what I was doing online. But it's amazing how quickly we adapt uh, to new environments and within a couple of years. Now I've been teaching online. I teach regularly online. Now, not only with the Teasel platform, but I've I've done individual uh, private teaching online during the past couple of years as well. And so we adapt to these things and uh, talk about inviting speakers into the classroom. Well, thank you very much for inviting me as a speaker into your homes today uh, because I'm, I'm a guest speaker in, in your home and it's all because of the technology, but it's quite fascinating. There are cultural factors involved with with online and with second language teaching. Uh, the classroom applications include the following discussing cross cultural differences, emphasizing that no culture is better than another, but that cross cultural understanding is an essential facet of learning a language. And I think that's probably one of the most crucial points in this course. And if that concept was better understood by many people around the globe, uh, then the world would be a happier place to, to live in. But unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of animosity between some cultures and between even within some cultures, between different classes within a culture, there's, there's animosity and, and uh, problems are created uh, because People don't accept other people for what they are, and that that's a very unfortunate situation. When you're preparing lesson plans and presenting material, include among your techniques particular activities or materials that illustrate the connection between language and culture, because there's a strong connection between language and culture. The language of any culture describes the culture, and the culture is a, becomes a representation 
of the language itself. Teach your students that cultural connotations, especially of sociolinguistic aspects of language. Screen your methods for material that may be culturally offensive. The last thing you want to do is to bring in any material that might offend somebody in, in your classroom because it's just not it's just not a good way to go. Acculturation. What do we mean by that word acculturation? Can somebody define that for me? So when um, somebody who's uh, in a new country and has to assume some of the uh, uh, social mores and language and stuff like that, they're basically immersed in that culture. That's yep. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dave. Thank you. Perfect. And and they they become attuned to that new culture, uh, as Dave says, they become immersed in in the traditions of that culture, the conventions of that new culture, um, and they become part of it. Not that they need to become totally assimilated into the new culture, because it's important to experience cultural preservation uh, of, of somebody's original culture. So if you're from another country and, and you move to Canada, for instance, so, so Foresta uh, was from Iran originally, right? But now you're living in Vancouver. And so yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's very, very, very important for you to maintain and preserve cultural aspects of, of your Iranian upbringing. Uh, do you at home? Do you speak Farsi at home or do you speak English at home? We speak Farsi. Sure. So you're preserving your cultural language heritage as well. Yeah. That's that's good. And of course, coming up very soon, uh, you'll be celebrating no ruse. Yes, of course. Uh, it within it's within the next week, is it not? March 21st or March 22nd? Yeah, yeah. So so you're preserving aspects of your Iranian culture through maintaining certain activities. That's good. Good for you. Well, happy no ruse yes. to you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I invite you all to join us. Maybe online. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, you know, when when uh, when we have our session uh, next week, which is the 20th. Yeah. You, you could describe to us what you are. What you are doing to to set up for for no ruse. Of course, I'd be happy to. And maybe, yeah. maybe you could show us some of the, the decorations that you put up for no ruse. Yeah, maybe. Because no, no ruse for you is, is like our, our Christmas celebration and our New Year's celebration. Yes, it is. And uh, this year we were here for Christmas and it was the first time that I saw it uh, fully and I was in places that were, they were um, celebrating Christmas. It was really exciting for me. I learned a lot about it. Very good. I'm well, glad you enjoyed that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So we'll look forward to hearing about no roots from you. Of course. Thank you for Ashta. Thank you. So then we get into expectations that, you know, whenever we go into a new situation <clears throat> or, or we go into a new set of circumstances, we have expectations of how we think things are going to go and uh, teachers have expectations of students and students have expectations of teachers. And, and I say, well, that's all very interesting, but usually the expectations are wrong. So let's just have a quick look here. You know, many students expect teachers to have all the answers, but teachers are allowed to say, I don't know. Many teachers expect are expected to suppress their emotions as well as students suppressing emotions, but it's okay to express emotions as a teacher or a student. So by expressing emotions, I, I don't mean that, you know, I'm not inviting everybody to come onto the, the webinar and start crying or anything like that. 
but you know when Dave gave an answer to a question a few moments ago and I said that's it that's it exactly Dave that's a great answer thank you very much that's good so I was in effect expressing an emotion I was thanking him for giving an answer because if I if I say to a participant on the webinar that was a really lousy answer that you just gave and it didn't make any sense at all if I say something like that you'll never answer another question again. So positive reinforcement with the way questions are answered, positive reinforcement is, is extremely important in order to help things move forward in a positive direction. Interpreting intellectual disagreement as personal disloyalty. It's possible to interpret differences as an interesting exercise. Reward students for accuracy in problem solving and reward students for innovative approaches to problem solving. Students should speak in class only when called out by the student, by the teacher. Students admire friendliness of teachers and students are encouraged to volunteer their thoughts. I don't believe in, in this, this statement that students should only speak in the class when they're asked a question by the teacher. That's why I said a little while ago, if you have any questions or you have something to say, please jump in and say it, or you know, raise, raise your hand on the screen or whatever you want to do to, to get my attention. But I always want to hear what the, what the participants have to say in the webinars. Teachers should never lose face. To do so also means losing the respect of students. I don't believe that because teachers can admit when they are wrong and still maintain the students' respect. You know, if I make a statement and then I realize that, oops, that was a mistake, I made a mistake there, if I tell you that was a mistake, but here's the correct answer. You're going to have more respect for me than if I let the wrong answer hang out there and don't say anything about it. Students expect the teacher to show them the way and teachers expect students to find their ways. I believe the correct approach is somewhere in the middle. I believe my role is to be a guide for you through the process of the course and guide you and make suggestions and, and, and lead you in a certain direction. But then I believe the, the students need to pick it up and you know do a lot of the work themselves. So I'm happy to, to work as a guide, but I'm not gonna do the work for you. Do those make sense? Yes. Any comments, any any suggestions, any thoughts? You know, it's very like, um, it's okay if you say that I don't know the answer because uh, we are the teachers. We are not, uh, you know, someone who has memorized everything. Sometimes, you know, in the classrooms, we face problems like uh, teach uh, students expect us to tell, uh, you know, the meaning of the words, difficult words. And at that time, I explained them, see, uh, we are the language instructors. Uh, if you are going to ask me just a word, I'm unable to, you know that if that is unfamiliar to me, I'm unable to answer it. Why? Because I need a context. If you will give me the context, I will be explaining you the answer of that one particular difficult word that is unfamiliar to you. And uh, uh, most of the time, I encourage my students that okay, sometimes it happens that uh, we learn from our students. Why? Because, you know, we are living in the age where uh, we have a, you know, uh, generation gap. And in that generation gap, uh, we have so much innovations like technology and everything. So uh, it might be like that, that we are not that much expert in, in using those technologies or implementing uh, those things in our classroom than our students. Yeah, uh, and they, are, they have command over it. So it becomes very easy. 
uh, and you know, uh, I always face that whenever I, uh, you know, uh, express these remarks in front of my students, my students always respect me. They never think of me like, a, uh, oh, teacher is saying that she doesn't know how to use this. Uh, they never, uh, you know, reply in this uh, way. Uh, they always encourage this thing that okay it's fine that we can learn from each other and um, most of the time it happens that we learn from our students so that's I exactly right you. here that i totally agree with you that that's a very good illustration of that point that's very good thank you okay. now we're going to look at some of the second language methodologies <clears throat> It's broken out, this chart is broken out uh, into these columns. And when you start into the modules, you will come across these different methodologies described uh, under the module sections on, on, on Canvas. The oldest and probably historically the most common methodology was the grammar translation method that used drills and memorization uh, in order to uh, learn new vocabulary and focused on reading and writing. So grammar translation, this is the method that was used thousands of years ago and, and during the medieval days by the priests in monasteries throughout Europe. They focused on, on uh, the reading and writing. They were copying the ancient Greek and Latin scripts and, and they were doing translation that way, and copying them into the vernacular German and French languages. It was also known as the classic method of grammar. And that grammar translation method, that was pretty much the, the mainstay of learning a second language in uh, universities and schools until the uh, the end of the the 19 the end of the 1800s the end of the 19th century at which point the direct method which is more naturalistic in the way that children learn a language the direct method started to evolve and came into to play it's based on conversation pronunciation there's a lack of grammar structure there's there are no written exercises it's more just copying the sounds, mimicking, it's based on communication. And the direct method was used by Charles Berlitz to create his own language method, which he called the Berlitz method. Except that the Berlitz method and the direct method are really the same thing. He just wanted a language method that has had his name on it. So the direct method came into use in the early 1900s, but because the direct method uh, works best in smaller groups of students, smaller classroom situations, it didn't last for very long because smaller classrooms means more teachers and it's, it's not as financially viable as a, a teaching system. The grammar translation method was able to use large groups of students with fewer teachers, so it was a, a cheaper system to run. So the, the direct method only lasted a couple of decades in the early 20th century, uh, and, and then World War II broke out. And when World War II broke out, it was necessary for the US military to develop a, a method of, of teaching the soldiers how to speak other languages because the US military was sending soldiers into enemy countries and allied countries, but sending them into enemy countries in Europe and the allied, the, the American soldiers needed to, to be able to speak the languages of the enemy countries, because if they didn't speak properly as, as though they were a naturally born individual in that country, uh, then they could be found out quite easily to be spies. And, and if they were caught being a spy, then they would be executed. And so it was a, a matter of life and death, literally, that the audiolingual method developed 
in World War II, and it was also referred to as the, the Army Method. And it's very similar to the Rosetta Stone program. And these are all based on pronunciation and native speaking features. So the instructors would just be uh, a native speaking individual. So, so if the, the American military wanted soldiers to learn German, they would bring a, a native speaking German person in to run the classes. The only language spoken would be the native German language so that the, the soldiers would learn to speak German as if they were a native speaking individual. And it was based on memorization drills. There was no grammar, nothing written. They were mimicking the sounds of the language they heard being spoken and pronunciation was key. So the audio lingual method became one of the most important methods in the 20th century, in the 20th century connected to, uh, to language learning. And then in the 1970s in the UK, uh, the notional functional syllabus was developed by the, uh, the Council of Europe and the notional functional syllabus uh, linked everything to the communicative language teaching, the CLT methodology of, of teaching. And notional functional syllabus is based on functional communication, uh, basic conversation. So there were different kinds of functions which which were identified and the language connected to those functions meant that the that was the basis of the teaching method. It was based around the functions of the words, functions of the language. This chart compares audio lingual, the army method with the communicative language teaching method. The audiolingual method attends to structure and form more than meaning. With CLT, meaning is paramount. Now, I'm not gonna read that entire chart through for you. I'll just leave the slide up for a moment. You can glance through it and get some key points. Probably the most Im important thing to remember with CLT is that it would allow for any device which helps the learners to improve their language is accepted varying according to their age, their interest, etc. So CLT would use anything that it could use, any means it, it available to help improve the communication. This chart and I'm saying that I'm not going to read the whole thing through to you, and you shouldn't try to copy it down either, because this chart is available. You'll come across it not only on the Canvas platform, but it's in the the uh, Teasel manual and uh, the Teasel concepts book that I'll, I'll be emailing to you if, if you request it of me. So you don't need to copy it up because it, it's available to you other places to look at. Okay. The communicative language teaching specifics. It is learner centered, focuses on learners' needs and goals. It gives some control to students through group work, for example. It includes the input of students that do not presuppose objectives in advance. It allows for student creativity and innovation. It enhances a student's sense of competence and self worth. It is cooperative. There are collaborative efforts. It is interactive learning using pair work, group work, real world contexts, meaningful communication, performing classroom tasks, practicing oral communication, and writing to and for real audiences. Whole language education. The whole language is a label that has been used to describe cooperative learning, student-centered learning, focus on the community of learners, focus on the social nature of language, use of authentic natural language, meaning-centered language, and integration of the four skills. 
these are additional 21st century methods. C21 just means 21st century. Total physical response, TPR, based on action and talk. It coordinates speech and action. So action songs that the children are taught to sing. Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, reach for the sky. And so the children are doing actions while they're singing the words. It helps to reinforce the language learning. Immersion is creating an environment where the student actually lives in the home of, of a foreign language speaking family, a real environment that increases fluency. The lexical approach based on vocabularies, idioms, expressions, slang, local terminology. It's a naturalization objective here. The humanistic approach is more casual based on social and emotional priorities has a, as its objective and uh, general interests. And then the learner centered needs based modified syllabus based on need and it's connected often with employability. So if a student is learning a language uh, because they need to do that in order to improve their employability, then it's a needs based uh, realization. Other other updated 2020 methods, outcomes based. This, this came out at the University of Hong Kong in 2017 when uh, the committee there decided to, to identify the outcome that they wanted university students to have. And then courses were designed, developed to lead to the outcome. So, if you knew what the outcome was, you were able to design a course to achieve the outcome. And mechanisms were developed to reach that outcome. The teaching and learning environment has definitely changed in, in 2020. In these recent couple of years, social media interactive approach, social media during the pandemic, social media became extremely important as means of communication and social media exploded with the different, the different platforms. Webinars and online presentation skills, these are just necessary to have these days. It's very important to, to have what online presentation skills for doing webinars, having these skills that, that work and fit into uh, these platforms. MOOC and e-learning. We're gonna talk a little bit more about MOOC in just a moment, in another context. <clears throat> these are the various social media platforms and the online groups that were, uh, that became so important in the, uh, during the pandemic days. So in the next class, we'll be looking at four skills language of teaching and looking at samples of conversation activities. I mentioned a moment ago that we were going to talk about MOOC. How many of you folks know what I'm talking about when I say the, the DORA research grant, the research award through TEASL? Are you familiar with what I mean by that? It's no. an online opportunity to, uh, you know, complete a course. And well, it's yeah. connected to this to this TESOL course. So, uh, the DORA, DORA is an acronym. It stands for Distinctive Online Research Award. Mm. It supports faculty research within teacher candidates' distinctive program areas, which include online TESOL and ESL studies, social justice, common good in education, equilibrium, peace studies, language education, <laughs> aiding employment in developing countries, teaching English to children of minorities, teaching languages to autistic children, teaching methodologies and community learning services. 
the DORA research award is provided before your research begins. Complete the research as part of your research project during the TESOL studies supervised by a TESOL Canada faculty member. And they're now, they're now introducing this DORA program with your group. You're the first group that they're, they're bringing this into, into place with. So previously, uh, there was, for previous groups recently who did TESOL, there was a MOOC research paper that they had to do as well as a MOOC project. But the DORA guidelines are now aiming to join both of those together so that you will have a research study that leads to a MOOC project in line with that study. Had any of you been given any information about about Dora? No. Yes. Yeah, I'm a um, Dora candidate. Okay, very good. Are you, if you're not familiar with with the Dora program, what I'm talking about, you might want to uh, you might want to send Simon Baker an email and ask him to share more information with you about Dora. Actually, I was uh, uh, with Dora too, uh, and uh, I read there is uh, some kind of assignment or essay that we should write, especially for Dora. Uh, can you explain that? What should we do? Well, the the uh, the research paper is is basically and that's a very good question that you're asking for Esther, the DORA research paper is, is very much uh, just an essay about the history of MOOCs and uh, just pulling up my MOOC research paper here. Just give me a moment to get it open so I can show you what my MOOC research paper was. Just share this with you. So when I did my MOOC essay, it was about uh, talking about the different methodologies and technologies used for MOOCs. First of all, it, it's very important for you to know what MOOC stands for. What does MOOC stand for? A massive open awesome. online course. Yeah, correct. Massive open online course. That's right. And and so, with these MOOC programs, uh, the essay they want you to talk about methods and technologies that are used. Uh, they want you to talk about MOOCs that you've looked at and investigated. So I talked about uh, online courses that I've done as a student. Aside from Teasel and also online courses that, that I taught. So I, I was teaching university courses through Zoom and I used Moodle and Google Drive platforms in that university teaching that I did. And you're asked to review some MOOC platforms and talk about them. So I, I reviewed these four platforms and, and I talked about them. And then I also referred to a, a, a paper written by, by Paul Stacy, which was uh, very good, uh, a very good paper, I thought. I'll, I'll put the link to that article in the chat box in just a moment. You can use his article as one of the items that you refer to in your MOOC essay. So I talked about that and then I talked about uh, the process to create an online course. And I had a conclusion and a, a summary table. So I created this chart, this table 
as an appendix to the paper because it took less space than actually writing it all out. It's more a space saving thing to save the number of pages because I already had six pages in the assignment, but it wasn't supposed to be that long. But by doing this chart, are you able to read what's on the chart? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. So, so I created this chart because I wanted to. To show the advantages and disadvantages for online and in class. Of all these different items. On the left hand side. So, I created the chart and filled in all the boxes. Uh, with with data that I, I pulled from all my readings. And then I put together these these references. Does that help for us to, to, to give you an idea of what you're supposed to do with the course? Yes, of course, it was great. And uh, I have just one more question. Uh, should it be in APA style or which style? APA is, is the preferred style, yes. Thank you. So I'll, this link to Paul Stacy's article, I'll put that in the chat box. Thank you. But I, I have to stop sharing screen in order to to see the chat box. So let me just copy that link. So here's the link to Paul Stacy's article. There it is. So copy that link. Uh, you need to copy the link while we're here in the webinar because the the chat box uh, does not show up in the recorded webinars. You're not able to get these these items later out of the chat box. You have to do it while we're right here. So this Dora program now, you would write an essay where you would research something connected to MOOCs some aspect of teaching uh, second language to a group of, of people and, and uh, then you would design an online project so you would you would begin the designing of a, a MOOC project it might be a, a MOOC course so maybe you want to design a course for teaching language teaching lang a second language to some group of students. And you would design a home page for your course that would describe it like that home page that TESOL has, you know, got a photograph on it and it talks about the course and how it developed. So you'd have a home page describing your course, then you'd have a table of contents, and then you you would do you would prepare uh, two or three modules, the beginning lessons of your course. And that would be that would be the project portion of the DORA assignment. Okay. Does that help? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's so exciting. Yeah, to have our own MOOC. Yes, it it, it is. When you prepare those modules of that course, you could prepare them uh, so that they were in the design of what you see on the Canvas platform with the, the TESOL course that you're doing. Or you could design them so that they are modules inside a PowerPoint, for instance. Mm -hmm. So the lessons that I have done, the PowerPoints that I've made and prepared for or presenting material to you folks, you can use them as a guideline. Do you know how to add voice recording on a PowerPoint? Yes, I do. Because you, you can prepare a PowerPoint and then you can record information you record it? on the PowerPoint. And it becomes a, a, a set standalone, it's a, a self-teaching item then and the PowerPoint, the student can play the PowerPoint, they can hear the recorded message that's on the PowerPoint. So that's an, another 
very good way of, of doing that. I did that when I was teaching at the university, I would prepare PowerPoints and then I would do the voiceover recording on the PowerPoint. And I put that up on the Moodle platform at the university. And the requirement was that the students were required to review the PowerPoint and listen to the recorded information before they attended the class. So you can you can prepare something to that effect as well. So we're out of time for today. I will answer any questions anybody has quickly before we go. Uh, but another day, I, I have a PowerPoint that I use as a, a working PowerPoint. I'll open it up and, and I'll show you how to do the voiceover recording so that any of you who don't know how to do it, you'll see how it's done. And I'll also play the uh, play part of the the recording from my university course that I did, but we don't have time to do that today, unfortunately. Does anybody have any questions? I have one. Uh, actually, I know that this is a self paced program, but uh, the sessions are. Three sessions a week in like less than one month. So if we participate the classes, the sessions, but we can't keep up with it uh, in reading materials or things like that, is it okay that we read them later and be in contact with you? Uh, that's fine, but you want to uh, you want to read the material and. You want to try to keep up with the work as much as possible so you get your certificate. Yeah, of course. But you're right in that it is self-paced. And so if you're not able to get all the assignments done, for instance, in the time frames that are suggested, and, and that suggested time frame is that you, you would submit the assignment two weeks after it is assigned to you. Uh, if you can't quite get that done, and it might take you three or four weeks to hand an assignment in, that's okay, that's not a problem. It might delay when you actually graduate from the course at the end of the exercise, but because it is self-paced, if you need a bit of extra time on something, just send an email to Simon Baker and say, I can't, hi Simon, I, I just have too much in my life right now, I can't complete this exercise on time, I'll hand it in within the next couple of weeks. And that's not a problem. You won't okay. lose marks. You won't lose marks. Uh, you don't get kicked out of the course. You know, you, you are able to extend the length of the time that you need to complete the material. Okay? Okay, thank you. And I see EJ, you just joined us uh, just very late here in the class. And so you, in order to, to see today's webinar, EJ, you're able to go to the Canvas platform and let me share that so you can see what I'm talking about. Sometimes I forget to share the screen and people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So if you want to see today's webinar again, go to announcements. It won't be up there yet, but it'll be there soon. It'll be up on the YouTube channel soon. So you can go inside the YouTube link and you'll be able to see today's webinar uh, soon. It's just, of course, of course the webinar is not over yet today, so that's why it's not showing yet today but that's under announcements, okay? So does anybody else have any last minute questions before we say goodbye for today? All right then, have a good week folks. I'll see you next Monday. Thank you very much. Glad to have you all in the you. with us here. You. And look forward to working Good with you. Cheers, thanks. thanks. Take good care. Thank Bye. You. Have a good day. Bye. Stay safe. Bye for now. Have a good day.